Sports Extra. I'm your host, Ali Gohar. Today, we're going to talk about the greatest athlete that's ever walked the earth. Cassius Marcellus Clay, later known as Muhammad Ali, was the greatest boxer there's ever been. Uh, he really had it all. He had strength, he had speed, he had tremendous skill, uh, an abundance of stamina, and what's more, he had this incredible ability to psych out his opponent in and outside the ring. But just to call Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Ali a great athlete uh, doesn't do justice to the man. He was also extremely principled. He took, he took a strong stand against the Vietnam War. He refused to fight in the Vietnam War, which is why he couldn't box uh, for uh, three and a half years. And that was quite a divisive position to take at that time. And uh, what's more, he also took a lead role in the civil rights movement, making sure that uh, blacks and whites were equal. He took a lead role in that and he went all over the media telling everybody all over the world just how important it is, how important it is to give black people in America the rights they deserve. His really is an amazing story of a singular man who touched us all and the, in, in, a, in, a, in a way that a true champion can only do it and he was a wonderful entertainer. So to talk about Muhammad Ali in great detail, I have one guest in the studio with us today, but before I introduce my guest, our PTV World production team has uh, made a special package on the life and skill of Muhammad Ali. Let's have a look. I am the greatest. At the height of his career, Muhammad Ali was known for his dancing feet and quick fists and his ability, as he put it, to float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Born Cassius Marcellus Clay, Ali shot to fame by winning light heavyweight gold at the 1960 room Olympics. Nicknamed the greatest, the American beat Sonny Liston in 1964 to win his first world title and becoming the first boxer to capture a world heavyweight title on three separate occasions. Crowned Sportsman of the Century by Sports Illustrated and Sports Personality of the Century, Ali was noted for his pre- and post-fight talk and bowl fight predictions just as much as his boxing skills inside the ring. But he was also a civil rights campaigner and poet who transcended the bounds of sport, race and nationality. In 1967, Ali took the momentous decision of opposing the U.S. war in Vietnam, refusing to be drafted into the U.S. military. Subsequently, he was stripped of his world title and boxing license. He would not fight again for nearly four years. After his conviction was overturned in 1971, Ali returned to the ring and fought in three of the most iconic contests in the boxing history. Though he was handed his first professional defeat by Joe Frazier in the fight of the century in New York in 1971, he came back to regain his title with an eight-round knockout of George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle in Kinshasa, Congo in 1974. Ali fought Frazier for a third and final time in the Philippines in 1975, coming out on top in the Thriller in Manila when Frazier failed to emerge for the 15th and final round. He eventually retired in 1981, having won 56 of his 61 fights. Ali's diagnosis of Parkinson's came about three years after he retired. The world is currently mourning the death of the legendary boxing champion. George Foreman, who was Ali's opponent in the legendary Rumble in the Jungle bout in 1974, took to Twitter to share his grief. Boxing champion Floyd Mayweather Jr. told reporters that Ali had inspired the black community. He was absolutely incredible. Rest in peace, champ. And like I said, we have one guest in the studio with us today to talk about uh, uh, Ali's life in greater detail. I have with me uh, Mr. Omar Ali, who's a boxing enthusiast. Omar, great to have you on the show. Well, it's great to be here, Ali. Thanks for having me. You're more than welcome. Uh, Omar, in 1964, just before uh, Ali fought Sonny Liston to win his first heavyweight title, he kept saying that he was the greatest. Hmm. And let's face it, he was right. He really was the greatest. Well, you know, um, right now, I mean, we know he was the greatest. Not only was he the greatest boxer of all time, but quite possibly, you know, the greatest athlete of the past uh, 100 years. Um, and at that time, you know, for a person to be so vocal, so outspoken about the fact that he was the greatest, even though he, at the time he was uh, a seven to one underdog the first time uh, he fought Liston and, uh, you know, just the degree of confidence that he had, just the self-belief, uh, it was, uh, 
you know, that was a huge uh, part of his natural magnetism, which sort of drew everyone towards him. And, um, you know, six rounds into the fight, I mean, he shook the world. You know, not only did he change the way that uh, uh, boxing was fought, but, I mean, you know, he changed the way that boxing was viewed in the States uh, and around the world. So, um, yeah, uh, it's really hard to argue that he wasn't the greatest. You've touched on a very important point. In, in one sense, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali was way ahead of his time. He was very good uh, at using the media. The media had just come to the fore as far as boxing was concerned. Boxing, mm -hmm. remember, uh, wasn't <coughs> the most popular sport. But uh, Ali, like you said, uh, took the world by storm and the media was very uh, interested in him because he was outspoken. Uh, many would say extremely cocky, but he had the right to be. So he won a lot of his fights, many could argue, outside the ring. He had this, uh, his psychological warfare was quite remarkable. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, uh, there's so many different stories about him, uh, you know, hyping up the fight uh, beforehand and calling out which round he was going to knock out his opponents in. And, uh, you know, more often than not, he was right. I think something like 16 or 18 times he called out exactly which round he was going to get a knockout in. Or he would uh, predict with uh, shocking accuracy, you know, exactly how the fight would go. So, uh, you know, not only did that show that, yes, you know, I'm confident, but like uh, a lot of people argue that like he was so good that, uh, you know, it was really up to him as to when he wanted to end the fight, you know, and... Uh we'll get to his boxing and his skill, but I just uh, want to uh, talk a little, bit, uh, a little bit more about how he used his words. And he wasn't oh, uh, a, an educated man. Let's face it. I mean, in the sense he didn't receive a yeah. proper formal education. He didn't go all the way. But his use of words was incredible and his, his poetry, he was so incredibly eloquent, which, and I don't mean to sound dramatic, I mean, you could tell just the way he would speak. Mm. He really was one of God's special people. Well, absolutely, you know, he just had this natural uh, charisma about him. And like, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that he was one of the greatest poets of our time, but, you know, he had uh, this uh, uncanny ability to pick out a rhyme or two. And um, if he jives, I'll drop him, drop him in five. Like he'd say exactly, stuff like exactly, that. Exactly, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, and, and, and the media was actually uh, one of the tools that he used in the ring. Obviously, he wasn't using it at the time, but like, you know, to psych out his opponents from, uh, from uh, you know, before even the fight started. For example, the first time when he fought uh, Sonny Liston, you know, he was, uh, it was. Uh, almost unheard of for one boxer to crash the training camp of another boxer mm. and call him big ugly bear and call him on big ugly bear but he would do it you know time and time again you know and uh, before the fight he would uh, follow him around town you know like he was going to wear uh, Sonny Didn't he go outside his house dinner? and taunt him absolutely yeah, I think he did that as well absolutely just uh, and like you know and and at that time you know he wasn't as big and as uh, muscular as he became later on in his fight because at this point he's still uh, 21 22 years old so his profile was actually a little bit more you know diminutive he wasn't as uh, bro broad as he was so for him i think he he a lot of people say like including his uh, biographers that at the time that he fought listen he was scared so uh actually that's a little bit where it comes from you know for him to muster in everything that he possibly could but is fear necessarily and, and i know you box a little bit umar is fear necessarily a bad thing i mean doesn't it make you uh, more yeah. alert it does it does it's not a bad thing uh, especially, you know, and I'm sure you've played sports and like, uh, every time you're about to play something, you get this uh, nervous energy. Right. And uh, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. It's all about how you harness it. Uh, when Bill Clinton was talking about Muhammad Ali right after he died, he said, the first time I watched him box, I knew I was watching someone very special and something that I'm probably never going to see again because he was a mixture. He, it was a combination. It was like he is this man a ballerina or is he a boxer? Mm. Because he moved so well, he was so incredibly quick and he was uh, one of the few boxers who could punch off the back foot. As he was moving back, he could still deliver uh, a lethal punch. Absolutely and um, you know, when he first came onto the scene, when he broke out in 1964, uh, no one, at least not a heavyweight, had ever been able to move the way he moved. You know, he was bouncing up and down. He could go in and right. He was uh, slipping punches. 
And uh, you're absolutely right when you say he could even throw punches off the back foot. And a lot of that had to do is that, you know, because he was uh, slipping punches, getting into these awkward angles, uh, he put himself in great positions to counter from and uh, really took advantage of his reflexes more than anything. As I said, he was a very principled man. He took a strong stand against the Vietnam War, which, is a which was incredibly divisive uh, mm -hmm. at the time. And he didn't get a lot of support uh, mm -hmm. for not fighting in Vietnam. And that's why uh, he was uh, supposed to be jailed, but he avoided jail time instead. He couldn't box for three and a half years. So many would argue that he lost uh, his prime years. When he was at his peak, he couldn't box. Yeah, I mean, I don't... I don't think there's uh, much to argue about on that front. I mean, it's a uh, simple fact, you know, like a boxer's uh, most prized years are when you're in your mid-20s. Uh, and during that time, you know, he wasn't allowed to fight. He had his passport taken away. Uh, so he wasn't allowed to leave the country and fight abroad. And uh, I think at the time, uh, almost every single state, you know, outlawed uh, giving him a boxing license. So right. Um, and he wasn't just principled when it came to the Vietnam War. I like to think he took a, a pretty, um, a pretty good stand, uh, you know, in a whole bunch in of many, things. In many it, ways, like the civil rights ways. movement, of course, yeah. it was something, of course, being a black man in the United States, growing up in Louisville, Kentucky, where Jim Crow's laws were prevalent. He obviously saw the way African Americans uh, were treated. But mm -hmm. uh, the best thing about Muhammad Ali was, although like he was very outspoken at times, many would argue a little bit arrogant and because uh, of the way he spoke, sometimes he wouldn't get his message across. But he talked about equality. He really wanted to be, he didn't want to say, look, we don't, he said, look, black people in America don't want any special privileges. We just want to be equal. Right. Absolutely. You know, and, um, up until that time, it wasn't common at all for athletes in general to be, you know, outspoken social pundits in any way. Yeah. Uh, let, let alone a black athlete to do all that, you know. So just by being a loud mouth on its own, you know, that was kind of a stance as it is because he was almost, uh, uh, I would say, the first black athlete to do that, if not the first yeah. athlete. Uh, and then going, uh, going on from that to speak against the Vietnam War, you know, and... Uh, Back in 1967, when he did speak up against it, you know, we didn't have uh, the internet, we didn't have cable TV, so uh, um, the nation, the, uh, you know, uh, and when I say the nation, I'm talking about the U.S., they hadn't uh, heard about any, uh, they hadn't heard anyone speak against the war. And like, you know, later on, people like Frank uh, Sinatra, Elvis Presley, these guys, you know, they went and, you know, they had a, uh, non, I guess, combat type roles in the Vietnam War, but you know they did go to show uh, their support to the troops. But uh, you know, Muhammad Ali, he wasn't like that. He right. said, you know, I'm against this thing and in he was all his forms. Very and, upfront uh, yeah. about it. And uh, to talk about uh, Muhammad Ali's uh, role in greater detail, we have um, uh, Farzana Bari online with us, a human rights activist. Farzana Bari, Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum, Jee. Uh, Fazana Bari, uh, in my introduction, I said Muhammad Ali was a lot more than just a great athlete. He was a very principled man and he took a very strong, but at the time, very divisive positions. And uh, we also earlier mentioned that he took a lead role in the civil rights movement. Tell me, how important was uh, Muhammad Ali's influence in the United States at that time? I think he was a phenomenal personality, phenomenal player and, and a right activist. And I think especially back in the 60s, if you remember that, was the time when they, it was, there was a rise of civil movements, uh, there was a student movement, black movement, black, um, you know, and then um, someone like him who had a very, um, you know, a kind of a high profile because he's been... Um, you know, a um, uh, very good uh, uh, boxer who was, again, uh, I think he was phenomenal. And um, and not only, uh, and then, of course, he suffered himself as a double jeopardy being a, uh, being a black and also actually Muslim because uh, although in those days uh, Muslim, being uh, Muslim identity was not such a, a marker of, you know, like discrimination and uh, um, a, a kind of um, 
you know, um, negativity would not invoke as much. But I think in this case, because he was not only black, but also was a Muslim, um, and then he was speaking out and uh, he refused to go to uh, Vietnam. He was challenging America's policies at that time, and the Ma- 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 America was on the peak, you know, in terms of, um, you know, being the superpower and um, completely, like, sort of unchallenged and uh, uh, even Americans see, felt that uh, now I think there's a lot more voices in America which are very critical of American economic frameworks and America's policies, you know, outside, um, you know, around the world, global policies which are not very pro-human um, and pro-people. Um, but at that time, um, I, I think that, that, that internally there wasn't really uh, so many voices of uh, dissent and contestation within America um, uh, in terms of challenging uh, America's policies um, around the world, and particularly um, its aggression uh, and imperialist design in Vietnam and around the world. So I think Muhammad Ali was very vocal. I, I, I think this is also quite incredible because um, he was the one who, who also he was also kind of their national figure, you know, and then uh, uh, you know. Sticking one, uh, you know, his hand out and say the right things at the right uh, time and the moment. I think that wasn't. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't easy for anyone. But uh, he was a man of, uh, I think, principle, and he was committed to human rights uh, kind of uh, principle, and uh, he was very vocal. Um, so I think that's why he was not only loved by. Muslims, but he was loved by all those who who believe in humanity and who believe in uh, social justice. He was extremely outspoken uh, in a time of uh, at a time where uh, control in the United States was uh, severe. Uh, but you see, uh, Farzana Bari, many are arguing that like uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, the way he, he was so outspoken and fighting for the rights of African Americans, because at the at the time they were second class citizens, uh, perhaps even lower than that. I mean, Jim Crow's laws were still uh, prevalent in the early 1960s in the uh, in the United States. Uh, but for Zana Bani, uh, Bari, many are arguing that um, uh, athletes or sportsmen or people who have a platform in Pakistan can do something similar the same way a uh, Muhammad Ali did because maybe the situation is getting better for minorities there's still a lot of work to do so many athletes in Pakistan cricketers hockey players squash players whoever has influence can maybe uh, be more outspoken and take similar stands your thoughts this, the, the, um, he is uh, definitely a role model for um, uh, particularly those personalities, no matter which field, whether you are an athlete or you are in the showbiz or wherever one is. I mean, the way uh, when you have that kind of uh, public attention and the world attention on you because of you have become like someone who is exceptional, um, you know, um, is, is good, um, whatever one is in one profession, um, then uh, using that limelight, using that public attention to also bring the issues of injustices, the issues of discrimination, issue of rights violation, I think that shows the person, you know, then you are a real person, you know. You are not you are not only an individual who is maybe good at boxing or who is good at, you know, doing something good, but you are um, a person who uh, who is more than, a, more than a, you know, a, a, an individual. I mean, the larger than kind of a life sort of, a, then you become larger than life, you know. And I think Muhammad Ali won't become a larger of um, a life. And similarly, uh, anyone who is... Uh, has that kind of kind of profile once once uh, once they these people start talking about the right things and uh, talking about if there are injustices happening i think that them, that one voice then become uh, you know like equal to um, a, a kind of a social movement you know the kind of the impact it becomes like because then everybody is, um, you know, listen to them. They also have this, uh, you know, huge fan um, sort of a, um, a base. And uh, and also their voices uh, are not normally easy for the uh, city governments and the other, you know, in the global 
um, kind of decision making, people uh, sitting in decision making bodies to ignore those voices. There can be a lot of embarrassment if they are if they are pointing out towards these policies, you know, which are clearly violating people's rights. You know, that if the if the um, uh, somebody who is who is a hero, basically your hero, then they talk about these issues because of uh, you know they they made up um, their own position, personal individual position in life. Right. When they talk about the larger issues and the collective issues of uh, then obviously I think then um, they become much they they bigger than 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 just a, a individual. And um, uh, uh, Muhammad, we are, I'm, uh, we have to leave it at that. Farzana Bari, thank you very much for talking to PTV World and sharing your views. That was Farzana Bari speaking about the impact of uh, Muhammad Ali. I still have Umar Ali uh, in the studio uh, here with us. Uh, Umar, as we speak, we're going to uh, watch clips of Muhammad Ali's uh, 10 best uh, knockouts. So uh, back to Muhammad Ali, the boxer. So he was off for uh, three and a half years. He oh. was off for three and a half years <coughs> and um, he lost to Joe Frazier in New York and he couldn't quite uh, handle that defeat. And True. then he, uh, and then. But it's important to note that when he did lose to Joe Frazier, he won two fights right before that. And a lot of people uh, forget that. I like to throw it in there just so you know we have clarity. <laughs> we, have, we have some degree of clarity over there. Uh, he fought uh, Jerry Corey and Oscar Bonavena right before Joe Frazier. But uh, even though he did lose to him the first time he fought him, I think there's a, there's a little bit of an asterisk next to that fight, you know, because he had been inactive for about four years. And here we see him. Uh, pummel some poor block into submission once again. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's so quick that I can't see his Extremely hands nice. moving. I mean, that that's how fast he was. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, for you, I mean, Omar, what... I mean, this sounds a bit silly, had so many attributes, but for you, what made him extraordinarily special in the ring? What made him unique? Well, what made him unique is, uh, I guess, a little bit of everything, I guess, you know, because uh, we'd never seen a heavyweight being able to I'm speaking able to technically like mainly. Forget the psychological warfare well, right yeah. now, technically. Yeah. Well, technically speaking, you know, as a big man, he used to have a very quick and uh, stinging like jab, which uh, hadn't been done uh, up until he st started to fight. And it was really uncommon for a heavyweight boxer to hold his hands as low as he did. Uh, and even over here, you can see, you know, he doesn't really have his hands up at all. You know, he's got his hands down. But um, more than anything, uh, I would say it was his speed and his reflexes. Right. Uh, now on to Muhammad Ali, the psychological warrior. We mm. talked about uh, uh, Joe Frazier. We'll get to Thriller in Manila. But before that, I want to talk about the way Ali used to psych out his opponent. And no better example was his boxing match against George Foreman, the Rumble in the Jungle. And once again, Rumble in the Jungle. Ali was an underdog. And uh, the first seven rounds, he let Foreman beat him. He was up against mm -hmm. the ropes, put his hands up and let Foreman tire himself out and taunting him at the same time. He kept Absolutely. saying, show me something, show me something, sucker. Absolutely. You ain't got nothing. But he got so tired by the end of it that the eighth round, Ali just gave him the good old one, two and he fell and nobody could believe that he regained the heavyweight title at 32. Absolutely. I mean, it was uh, it's one of my favorite fights of all time. You know, uh, we see in the first round, he kind of jumps at him, you know, to put George Foreman on the back foot. But I mean, as the fight goes on, he realizes uh, that, you know, he can't really move this mountain of a man that was George Foreman. And then uh, um, if you believe him and if you believe a couple of his uh, biographers, Later on, he goes on to say that that, uh, the, that the rope a technique that he did come up with is, uh, he says that he, improvises, uh, that he improvised it on the fly. Um, I, he said that he noticed that the, rings, uh, that the ropes were just a little bit loose, that uh, George Foreman was a little bit slower than he thought he was, you know, and uh, in boxing, if you can see your punches, if, if you can see the other guy's punches coming, it's kind of easy to brace for impact, if you would. Well, uh, he did say uh, before the fight that George Foreman's like a mummy. He's very slow. He, exactly. named Su he nicknamed Sonny Liston Big Ugly Bear and mm. uh, George Foreman the mummy because he moves very, very slow. And oh, not, Well, not that he mm. did. I guess it was just a way to psych him out. But Ali was clearly uh, much faster. And he, he completely outfoxed him in that. And nobody thought he would at, thir at 32 years of age. 
I, and you know, a big part of that is because uh, in the 1974, was it? Yes. Back then it was unprecedented for a premier heavyweight boxer to still be fighting at the age of uh, 32. So that's another first, you know? Um, and the reason why, you know, almost every single sports writer out there counted him out is because uh, it just hadn't been done that a 32 year old man could, you know, out box out class uh, and basically out fox a right. much much younger man well that was ali the psychological warrior let's talk about uh, ali the technician mm -hmm. uh, uh, in uh, when he fought george foreman thriller in manila that's arguably one of the greatest fights boxing matches there's ever been oh it is so not say it is i mean it but, is uh, yeah, yeah it was a tough fight i mean yeah. joe 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 frazier gave him a very difficult time and Muhammad Ali even said the best fighter after me was Joe Frazier. He was a distant second to Ali, but he had quite a punch. There's a famous clip where uh, George Foreman punched him with his left hand and it was mm -hmm. quite a brutal punch and Ali went down. So uh, full, full credit to Muhammad Ali then for not only withstanding Joe Frazier, but, but, beat, but beating him on points in the end. Mm. Well, you know, I mean, uh, definitely a lot of credit goes to Joe Frazier, uh, you know, every great sportsman needs another great sportsman to push him to uh, whatever level they like end Boris up Boris Beckham, going to. No, exactly. no, like, no, like McEnroe and uh, wh what was his name? I forgot his name all of a sudden. Uh, John McEnroe and... The other one. Boris, Boris uh, oh God. Boris what? Becker. Yeah, no, no, no. It'll come to me. It'll come to me, but <laughs> uh, I forget he was one of the greatest. Anyway, carry on. But yeah, you know, every great needs another great to push him to where they eventually end up going. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's true for almost any sport in the world. You know, Michael mm -hmm. Jordan had uh, people like Patrick Ewing, people like Hakeem Olajuwon that pushed him. Um, and I think a lot of times, uh, or sometimes at least, that Joe Frazier doesn't get the respect that he does deserve. You know, it's important to note that while Muhammad Ali was out, Joe Frazier was also deprived of that competition. So all the right. fights that Joe Frazier won in his absence, all the things that he did, uh, didn't really, you know, get as much uh, recognition as, you know, they would have had the civil rights movement not been going on concurrently at the same time. Right. Um, well, as you said, yeah, every, uh, like everybody, even someone as great as Ali needs a rival, a strong yeah, you rival. You need somebody to push And Bjorn Borg is the name I was thinking Bjorn. of. It was driving me crazy, Bjorn Borg <laughs> and John McEnroe. So yeah, everybody needs... Uh, some sort of competition. But uh, many argue that th the thing about Ali was that in a very, uh, uh, boxing is a brutal sport, let's yeah. face it, especially at that time. Now I think what, you go 12 rounds? They go, uh, they used to go 15 rounds. 15 rounds. And uh, he brought a lot of grace into the sport mm. with, his, w uh, with his unique movement. Well, you know, he was the first big man to bring out these uh, very, you know, deft and these uh, slick maneuvers like uh, the Ali shuffle that everybody knows, you know, where he sort of uh, shuffles his feet back and forth. Um, so small moves like that, he was, uh, a, he was definitely a, a pioneer when it came to f um, fighting like that. Um, oh, now sorry, you see, uh, the thing about Muhammad Ali was, was that like he, he, of course, he had a lot of fans. He was the most famous man in the world at the mm. time, probably still is, even after death, the most famous man in the world. Uh, which meant that he probably wanted to continue boxing. A lot of his fans, a lot of his admirers wanted him to keep going. But there were many that, wa that warned him to stop because he'd been around for, what, 27 years. By 1981, I think he'd been around for 27 years. So he 21. knew, or something like that, 20, yeah. 21 years. So he knew uh, the risks he was taking because a lot of boxers, after having a long career, become shambling wrecks. Right. But... Um, he refused. He want. He wanted to continue, and unfortunately, he paid the pr he he paid the price for that and had to battle Parkinson's disease uh, for I think 32 years. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's said that uh, the earliest effects of his uh, Parkinson's disease started to show up after the third fight with uh, Joe Frazier. Uh, you know, because both of them they pushed themselves so hard. They pushed themselves to the absolute limit. Um, and you know the reason Muhammad Ali won that fight is that Joe Frazier just couldn't come out for the 15th round, and uh, so things like that. And also, you know, uh, a big part of his game was uh, he never wanted to be hit in the face or teeth, you know, because he'd always be safe. So pretty. Like, oh, I, I'm so pretty. Look at my face. It's never been marked. And he was very preoccupied with that. And back then, we didn't realize that you know getting hit, uh, getting hit to the body can actually cause uh, nerve damage mm. as well. 
he just had his confidence But, absolutely was overwhelming and that's why he had so many fans he was being interviewed by michael parkinson so michael mm. parkinson asked him you know what why did you want to get into this he's like because i wanted to be the champion of the whole world i wanted to whoop every man in russia every man in china every man in japan every man in america so i just kept working till i did it and i don't want to be the champion of the whole world but better than all of those before me so you can understand why ali absolutely. maybe wanted to continue boxing and have and because of his confidence mm. and the way he carried himself he had so many fans all over the world and our ptv world production team uh, picked up a clip from uh, muhammad ali's fans after his death and this is what some of them had to say let's have a look this town trust me man this town loves him you hear me and the world loves them you know you don't hear no who talks bad about ali there's nothing to talk bad about he do, he do, he loved everybody now mr stranger will do anything for you and he's never you know i never seen him mad honestly and not only as a boxer but he was different as a human being this guy was probably one of the most i mean outrageous humanitarians you ever want to meet we were in portland oregon he sat in the back of a limousine and signed autographs for over four hours People were lined up, coming out of buildings downtown. We signed out of grass for over four hours. Everybody used to come and watch his fight. So I remember the um, Henry Cooper fight, and I loved his words, his little poems. The brilliant, lovely man. People who didn't even care about boxing knew who he was, and uh, you know you can you can talk about the brashness, the 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 bragging. Uh, The guy was shrewd. He, you saw that public face. We need a reacquaintance with Muhammad Ali. You're right. He's absolutely the dominant athlete of the 20th century, of our lifetimes, of numerous generations. Uh, arguably, maybe even the most important public figure of the second half of the 20th century. Those were fans speaking about uh, the greatest of them all, Muhammad Ali. He's got fans all over the world, and of course, Omar. I'm not surprised is a major fan. So, Omar, uh, we have to wrap up soon. We've only got two minutes. I'm not going to ask you a silly question about what Ali's legacy is going to be. That's been done over and over again, and it's, in fact, it's not a silly question. It's very hard to answer. Where does one begin? But tell me, as someone who wasn't born. Mm -hmm. uh, when Muhammad Ali was fighting, I didn't. I don't think you saw any of his fights live. You're too young. but he still had a major impact on you that just goes to show the way muhammad ali transcended boundaries absolutely generations absolutely i mean uh you know he meant so many different things to so many different types of people it really is hard to uh you know put a peg on what his legacy will be because it's not just about boxing and it's not just going to be about civil rights you know he also stood up for uh being a muslim in america which hadn't been done before he came along uh so i think uh i mean for me i mean he was a role model of mine he was an inspiration you know like i'd love his quotes i've seen a, a lot of his interviews so um you know from the way he carried himself he was always proud he never apologized for the type of person that he was his opinions uh to you know him being able to box the way nobody ever had before and nobody ever will and nobody ever will absolutely a absolutely he was a true champion and he touched us all in a way only yeah. a true and, and, entertainer can and i mean can. and i mean you know it's quite common for athletes to do something and their achievements uh, then later gets passed but you know let's keep in mind he was a heavyweight champion three times and that still hasn't been beaten by anybody absolutely well umar ali we'll have to leave it at that thank you very much for coming on sports extra and speaking to us thank you for having me it was a pleasure me. we'll be back after the break when we come back we'll be talking about the french open final stay tuned
اللہ کا احسان رمضان امتحان دینا ہے آنکھ کا زبان کا کان کا صبر کرنا ہے رویوں پر تازہ کرنا ہے روحوں کو منور کرنا ہے دلوں کو رمضان اللہ کا ہے Welcome back. On the last bit of Sports Extra, we'll be talking about the French Open final where Novak Djokovic defeated uh, Andy Murray. Novak Djokovic is in the form of his life. He's absolutely unstoppable at the moment. And Andy Murray too is in very good form. But unfortunately, he came up against Novak Djokovic in uh, the final. We'll talk about uh, the final in detail with our next guest in the studio. But before we do that, our PTV World Production team has prepared a special package on the French Open. Let's have a look. World number one Novak Djokovic beat Britain's Andy Murray to win his first French Open title and complete the career Grand Slam. He won by 3-6, 6-1, 6-2 and 6-4 to win his 12th major title. He becomes only the 8th man in history to have won all four of the sports major singles prizes and could yet match Laver's achievement of winning all four in a calendar year. Six, 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 six. On the other side, Spain's Garbine Muguruza beat world number one Serena Williams in straight sets to win her first Grand Slam title at the French Open. Fourth seed Muguruza won 7-5, 6-4 to make amends for losing last year's Wimbledon final against Williams. In men's double category, Feliciano Lopez and Mark Lopez won the French Open for their first Grand Slam title, denying Bob and Mike Bryan. They became the first Spanish pair to win at Roland Garros in 26 years with a 6-4, 6-7 and 6-3 victory over their American rivals. Lopez, Lopez. In women's double category, Caroline Garcia and Cristina Ladinovic defeated Ekaterina Makarova and Eline Vesnina by 6-3, 2-6 and 6-4, giving the home fans reason to cheer on the final day of a cold, damp tournament. This is Cis well, we won't only talk about uh, the Djokovic and Murray final, we'll also talk about uh, the women's final where Muguruza upset uh, Serena Williams. Many expected the great champion Serena Williams to beat Muguruza, but unfortunately for her, uh, that didn't happen. And to talk about uh, the French Open and all these wonderful tennis players in great detail, I have one guest in the studio with me. I have uh, Mr. Ali Mehdi, who's a tennis enthusiast. Ali, great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, Ali Mehdi, uh, Novak Djokovic, not only is he incredibly skillful, but he's extremely resilient. He's got this never say die attitude. And I say that because he was one set down and Murray was brimming with confidence. But after that, Novak Djokovic just didn't look back and, well, more or less annihilated him. Yes, that's correct. Uh, you see, that, uh, this is actually the fourth time that uh, Novak Djokovic was playing in the French Open final. He had already completed, uh, he already has uh, had about 11 Grand Slams. Right. And this was the one Grand Slam which had eluded him. And it just shows his strength of character and his mental strength, how he managed to pick up his game and just take it to Murray and then, uh, and then uh, won it in straight sets after that. Well, Djokovic is sort of going through a Federer role, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Back uh, about, about uh, seven, eight years ago, Federer was unstoppable. And Djokovic is sort of going through the same thing, many would argue. But in your opinion, Ali, what's Djokovic's core strength? What makes him so successful? I think the thing which, uh, there are a number of reasons why he's actually, Djokovic has actually picked up his game. 
Over the past three years, he's been an absolute force in tennis. He's won all the Grand Slams now. He has the career Grand Slam. Only the eighth person in history to have their all uh, to complete the uh, to complete the this career Grand Slam. And then at the same time, there are certain reasons why Djokovic has actually is now in you know in the form is of, of his life. He actually completely rechanged his diet. He began, he went on a gluten-free diet. And then other than that, I think he's most settled in life now. He's married, he has a kid now. He feels at ease on the court now. He has Boris Becker, the great Boris Becker behind his back. So there are many things which have now actually falling into peace. All, uh, all the jigsaw, uh, all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle have now fallen into peace for Novak Djokovic. And technically his uh, serve is much better, is greater than ever, is the best. Mm -hmm. He's never served as well as he has, uh, as he is right now. And then at the same time, he's now his uh, baseline play, uh, he's taken it all to a new level. He's, um, his n net play is also an improved too, but at the same time, I think is where his core strength lies is that his all-round game, whether it should be on grass, clay, on hard court, he just makes it look so easy. Right. Uh, before, uh, before you came on, I was talking to uh, a guest, uh, Omar, who was here. He was talking about uh, Muhammad Ali and he mentioned uh, that every great player needs a rival to get the best out of him. So uh, Ali had Joe Frazier. Mm -hmm. uh, and now let's get, uh, uh, when we talk about tennis, you had uh, John McEnroe, and I forgot his name the first time I was talking about him, Bjorn yeah, Borg. Then Borg. you had Sampras and Agassi, yeah. uh, Federer and Nadal. Now would you say um, it's uh, all about Djokovic and Murray? Is that the new tennis rivalry? I do think that that is the new tennis rivalry. I still feel that Djokovic is on, on, is on another level. I mean, no matter how much... Sort of like Sampras and Agassi, whereas Sampras... No, but I actually on feel it's level. more one-sided. More right. one-sided one towards... The pendulum has shifted to more towards uh, Djokovic. The, the reason is because Djokovic is absolutely... You can't find a single... Uh, this false flaw, error, flaw, a flaw in his game. He's just improved on every, whether his, uh, whether his serve, you look at his uh, return of serve and then also his baseline play and then all coming up to the net, he's just unplayable at this moment. D Murray gave it his absolute, he threw the kitchen sink at uh, Djokovic, uh, but he just did not have an answer. And the, now getting back to your question about, uh, you know, one great, you know, inspire a new generation. The reason Djokovic has admitted many, many times, the reason why he is at this level is because of the great uh, Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal. He, when uh, Djokovic got off, started off his career and, you know, he became, he reached world number three and number four. There was a period of time he just could not get through uh, Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer. They would they would demolish him in every final or semi-finals whenever they play. But after getting Boris Becker behind his, uh, on his, behind his back and then at the same time tweaking his game a bit, he's, I mean, these guys have inspired him and now he's, you know, he's probably, one would argue, probably the greatest of all time. Right. Uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about the women because I, I fear that we might run out of time. If we okay. have time, of I'll course. get to Andy Murray. Uh, everybody expected so, you know, Williams to win, uh, given you know, j just how mm -hmm. brilliant she is on the court. But uh, Muguruza defeated her. This isn't the first Grand Fl uh, Slam final. Uh, Serena has lost. Uh, she didn't seem to be there. It, something was missing, that competitive uh, spirit, that never-say-die yeah. attitude that she plays with, that aggression just wasn't present. Serena Williams, over the past, uh, since the US Open of last year, after that shock defeat she had against uh, in the semi-final uh, at the US Open, she ha just hasn't been herself. She's had a lot of injuries this year. She's had some back injuries. She's had some thigh injuries. But at the other, uh, on the other side, Serena Williams just didn't throw this. She was just actually dragging her way through this tournament. She just wasn't finding that level, which ha has helped her over the past, uh, over the past 15, 16 years to win Grand Slams. And if you look her frame of mind going into this tournament, she just wasn't there. And then uh, one reason I actually feel, I personally feel that she didn't was, you know, because of the uh, demise of Muhammad Ali. Uh, she, soon after she lost this match, she did not mention anything. She did not congratulate uh, this, uh, uh, on her Instagram page and then on social media, she instantly posted a tribute towards Muhammad Ali. So I just felt that on the day, taking no credit away from uh, Muguruza. Muguruza, the thing is that Serena's l level was just, it, her f game was f 
flooded with errors and she just wasn't in there. She, yes, she had some physical problems too, but mentally she wasn't, you know, she wasn't No, you're, you're right, absolutely. And you mentioned Muhammad Ali. Uh, the first part of the show was all about yeah. uh, Muhammad Ali and mm. the impact that he had. Although his death didn't come as a surprise because he had been ill yeah. uh, for 32 years, it affected and still shocked uh, so many people. Mm. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Muguruza though. Uh, hmm. I've n I've rarely seen anybody returning Serena's first serve with such ease, but Muguruza was doing that. And not only was she returning them, she was hitting winners of her first serve. Muguruza has been on the scene for a year now, Ali. She's actually, if you, if she, both of them, interestingly, both of them played the, the last year's women's final was contested between these two, and Serena absolutely hammered uh, this Muguruza in straight sets. It was after that that Muguruza tweaked her game. At the same time, she upped her game. She won some WATA, WTA tournaments along the way. And this was her one tournament that, you know, she, she absolutely gave it everything. She, w she, gave, uh, she played with a lot of winners. She plays with a lot of freedom. She actually hit a lot of winners. But at the same time, you know, she comes as a very humble person. You, one must remember she's only 23. And, it is for the f uh, and she's probably the only the second player in history, uh, second player in her who to be born in the 90s who actually won a Grand Slam. Absolutely. Well, Ali, uh, we're bang out of time, so I have to end the show there. But thank you very much for coming on Sports Extra. Thank you for having pleasure. me. That's all we have time for. Keep watching Sports Extra on PTV World. See you next time. Bye-bye.